Mr. Gilstrap, you have a uh, friend and colleague in today. We I do. We'd love you to introduce him. Certainly. I am honored to have Claude Barraby here with us. I've known Claude since, like, forever. Um, he's a professor, a uh, history professor, or has been a pr history professor at the United States Naval Academy, director of the Naval Academy Museum, a uh, retired commander from the United States Navy. The, and actually, he was my host. He was the executive officer of the JTF Joint Task Force down in Gitmo. And got to spend a, a fun week. Guantanamo Bay. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Guantanamo Bay, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, we like to distinguish you were at Gitmo, not in Gitmo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 I guess that is an important distinction, yes. And um, he is now the author of, well, Third? three novels and and other books, The Philippine Pact. Go ahead and hold that up to the sure. camera. I could do mine. Sure. So, welcome to the show, Claude. Tell us about the Philippine Pact and about Connor Stark, the star of it. So, my three novels focus on uh, the biggest problem in the world right now, which is China and its efforts to exert its influence throughout the world. And Connor Stark owns this private Navy company and pops in and out around the world trying to deter Chinese efforts to become the number one superpower. And I think it's problematic, especially today, because they are now the largest Navy in the world. We are number two, and it's not something that's you know generally recognized, but they have certainly surpassed us. And so the, my, uh, my novels, certainly the good guys always win. Hopefully. I've learned a lot of lessons from you, John, over the way. You know, I, I, I write naval history, too, and I've written a couple of other books. Uh, but the Connor Stark novels, thrillers, are all about maritime and uh, dealing with terrorists and pirates and China and every, everything maritime. Yeah, Claude, you mentioned that China is the largest navy now. Let's mine down that a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, just there's so many components to a navy. There's certain parts of a navy that are more fearsome than others. Uh, as far as the frontline military ships, the frontline uh, uh, weapons of war, how do we stack up with China? All right, now I'm going to start off with a disclaimer. The views expressed by my owner are not those of the United States Navy or Naval yeah. Academy, although sometimes I wish they were. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's just look at the surface ships. They, they have 80% of their surface fleet has been built in the past 10 years. 20% of ours has been built in the past 10 years. They are extraordinary at building. They have one shipyard in Shanghai, which has more capacity than all seven of our major shipyards. So they have been out building us for the past 10, 15 years. It's starting to show. And on top of that, we have much older ships. Our cruisers are now decommissioning. I mean, we have littoral combat ships that are decommissioning almost at, at faster rate as, as they're commissioning. I shouldn't say that. It's, it's, I've actually done the numbers and they're starting to come down. Um, we just had the Ford class carrier deploy for the first time. However, when you think about it, the, the program that developed that was established in, I think, 90, 1997. And so we take a long time to put our ships to sea in some cases. So they have a numerical advantage. Uh, and if something were to happen in the South China Sea, you know, and as I put in a scenario in here where there's a couple of fleet uh, about, fleets about to engage, we, how many ships could we actually get out there in a, a short amount of time just because we have, say, th uh, you know, 280 ships more or less right now? It doesn't mean we could get 280 ships out to any region. You have ships that are under repair. You have, you know, down, you have downtime for sailors. They, they can't be deployed permanently, you know, like the Starship Enterprise or something. They, they have to have downtime at home on shore. So, yeah. so when it comes to the, the Navy... Um, isn't it all about the aircraft carriers anyway? I mean, I'm just, I, I, I'm a guy sure. who doesn't know a lot about mm -hmm. this. So uh, isn't it all about your, your air superiority? Or is that, are we still needing ships? A absolutely. Air superiority is still fundamental to this. Submarines are, are obviously key as well. It's, it's the whole package and you need a real diverse force in gotcha. order to be able to counter a lot of threats. Uh, China is now, I think they've now put out their third carrier. They may be building their fourth one right now. So at some point here in the next uh, decade or so, they're going to be equal to us. Now, that doesn't mean they're as good as us. We have a lot of experience out there. We have decades and decades of carrier experience. But then again, you know, we have uh, young folks who, who are in and out of the Navy, say, within five, ten years. So that experience, you know, that only buys you so much time. 
Yeah, going back to your point, Mike, uh, each type of ship has a particular function. If you're going to the doomsday scenario, right. where we're going to wipe everybody out, submarines will play the role there. Mm-hmm. If you're talking about more uh, limited engagement, that's where the aircraft carriers. If you're talking about uh, using the Marines or using the Army, you've got to have the amphibious ships. Uh, are, we you, still, are we still using battleships the same way we did back in the day with the no, big guns? No, I don't think no, we are, right? No, no, no. no the, battlesh- the last battleships came out of commission in the 19, early 1990s, shortly wow. after the Gulf War. Our largest surface combatants are cruisers. But again, those are being decommissioned. The last cruiser we commissioned, I think, was 1993. So that's a lot of wear and tear on those ships. And that's one of the advantages that China has is they have enough ships where they can deploy them to the Gulf of Aden, for example. You know, they're going for three, four-month deployments. Our ships are going out for, not you know, six to ten-month deployments, depending. And that's a, that's a lot of maintenance requirement on, on a ship. Is the Chinese Navy battle tested at all? We were all a year ago. We were concerned about all of these Russians ga- gathering on, at, at, yeah. in Ukraine, and the Russian army just kind of came apart. So um, I've likened it to the Spanish-American War in 1898, and the Spanish were wondering that question about well, the United States. They're a new navy. They, these are new ships, and they're not battle tested. Sure, we had the Civil War, but those were a different, by and large, different class of ships. So they they underestimated the United States, which had been built now built a very diverse uh, force uh, structure of different types of ships. They were fighting largely at home, you know, around Cuba, but also they did have uh, operations around Manila Bay for the battle. So I think, uh, you know, to suggest that somebody doesn't have that battle-tested experience doesn't always play out. So talk about, we talking, before we went on the, on the air, we're talking about the islands that the Chinese are building mm-hmm. in, in the Pacific. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. Uh, the islands are based on these small reefs. I mean, you could have a reef that popped up uh, during low tide that was maybe 10 square feet. And what the Chinese did is they started pouring con- sand, concrete, et cetera, uh, airstrips, anti-aircraft batteries, they have places to bring in their ships. So what essentially happens is now if you have several acres of an island that you've created, that is sovereign territory. But so too is the water outside there. So about 12 nautical miles on either side of that is deemed so that is deemed Chinese territory. So these are all contested, of course. You know, there are other people who are doing it, uh, uh, a couple of other countries. But by the same token, it makes it a lot difficult if you want to operate in the South China Sea that you have to now con- you have contested waters, whereas they used to be open. And these yeah. islands are not a, not just off the Chinese coast. They're building them all over the place. Is that correct? No, most, mostly in South China Sea. I haven't seen anything beyond that. But uh, they really try to look at what they have his- suggest is historically theirs. And, and again, always contested. Um, and it's it's is a, that it's a like challenge. between the strait the, between Taiwan and, and China? Is that uh, just really just south of there. Yeah, just south of yeah. There. Yeah, actually, you're 12 miles uh, territorial waters, but you can go out to 200 miles for other exclusive mm-hmm. exclusive zones. And this is one of the things that's encroaching on the Philippines. As you build these islands, what has predominantly been Philippine territory is now contested between China and the Philippines. And that, and that's why the Philippines becomes so important in mm-hmm. any you know potential. Uh, operation with China. I mean, as as is Taiwan. In fact, that's that's why I I I didn't realize it at the time when I was writing the Philippine Pact a couple of year about a year and a half ago. Uh, and it's about it starts off with a military exercise between the United States and the Philippines. And it's a very small island in the south in the South China Sea, Balabac Island. And just last week there was a, an article about joint U.S. Filipino operations in yeah. five places, yeah. including Balabac. And I was like, wait, I've never even realized that that was. Uh, you know, an option before, but so. Claude, how many books have you written? This was my seventh. I'm working on my eighth right now. So I kind of switch back between fiction and nonfiction. Uh, I'm currently finishing up a book about Admiral Rickover, father of the nuclear Navy. His second wife, late wife Eleanor, uh, bequeathed uh, about 100 boxes of his personal papers to the museum I direct. And so I've been going through those uh, since November, and I'm hoping to finish that up this summer and talk to my agent, and we're going to be looking for a publisher very shortly. So Fascinating. So how did you get into the writing the book business? Did you call? John Gilstrap? (laughs) (laughs) How did that relationship start? That was actually much later in my career. No, I I credit um, a professor of mine in grad school, and I I went to her one day. I said, you know, professor, I I don't know if I want to write, I really want to write fiction. I really want to write history books. 
She said, why don't you do both? And I was like, you can do that? Uh, so that, I, I really credit Laverne Kunke, uh, you know, God rest her soul, she was great. And uh, she was the one who really set me on the path of being able to do both. I was in grad school studying history, and uh, but I wanted to tell stories. And that's why in my novels, what I try to do is bring a little reality in it in terms of the geopolitical strategies, who the players are, what might happen in these kind of gray zones, as you might call it. And... Um, that's that's why I write. Uh, I try to. The first book was on Somali piracy, and I happened to be out there in 2005 on a Navy cruiser. Uh, when you were in the Navy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I retired as a Navy reservist, okay. but I had about ten and a half years of active duty uh, in, during that 24 year period, and so I served on a cruiser as the intelligence officer, and that was an, I was an intel officer in my career. Um, and then the second book was on uh, Tamil Sea Tigers in Sri Lanka. So I really try to bring in a little history, too. So that first book, how hard was it or how easy was it to get it published for, for, for the first time? <laughs> sure. The, the Aiden Effect was the first one. It was really funny because I went to, actually, it was Washington Independent Writers, an organization John and I were part of. And they had this, it's kind of like speed dating for, for agents. And you go, you have like about 10 minutes with all these different agents. And I went to one and he said, wait a minute. Uh, you got a book about Somali piracy. This is great, you know, but, you know, vampires are really big right now. Do you think you could make it about Somali pirate vampires? And I just looked at him. I said, would you like the Navy to be like werewolf sailors? So it's like, where he says, can you do that? And I said, I think I'm going to pass. Thanks. It's been two minutes. I'll move on to the next date, you know. Unbelievable. Uh, but, uh, my, yeah, my first two were published by Naval Institute Press. They had only done Hunt for Red October by Tom Clancy and Stephen Kuntz's Flight of the Intruders. And my aid, in fact, was the third. They did. Siren Song, and I've now got a new publisher, um, Sunbury Press, and uh, yeah, that's how that's how I I got into it. That was an easy sign after you, you heard the hit Hunt for <laughs> Red October. That, that was pretty good. Yeah. Claude, listen to your uh, to your podcast, one of your podcasts. Mm -hmm. I was struck by the fact of uh, I'm going to go uh, with President Trump. Uh, President Trump. Uh, uh, used as his model and President Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. But you made the point that the Trump approach to the Navy had similarities to that of the Jackson approach uh, at his time, Andrew Jackson. Yeah, there was there were some similarities. Um, the the one big difference though was his uh, Jackson's appointment of, of secretaries of the Navy, uh, contrary to you know the swamp uh, actions. Uh, he picked people who were both governors and senators. So they had executive experience, but they were also people who understood Congress so they could understand the budget. And that was very important as he's trying to restructure the Navy in the 19, uh, sorry, the 1830s and built, focused, first of all, on maintenance. He went to personnel salaries, and then he went to building uh, new, new, sh new ships. Mm-hmm. But he had a very, but his strategy was very uh, sound. I mean, the first part was I'm going to build economic trade uh, routes with new countries. Then I'm going to build a merchant. I'm going to have the merchant fleet support that, and then I'm going to have a navy that adequately supports our economy, and that's maritime trade. But we were, we've been, we were a maritime nation. We're not so much a maritime nation today. We don't have merchant ships like we did. We have about 70 or so. I think China has maybe 4,000 plying the seas. Well, that's kind of a misnomer in its own, own case. We build a lot of yeah. merchant ships, but we do not flag them because of expenses. We'll have other countries such as Panama flag them. So they, they're not really a U.S. ship, even though they may be operated. And they're not U.S. crewed. I mean, yeah. usually you'll have a Filipino crew. Yeah. You'll have Ukrainian captains. It's a, it's a, mixed, uh, a mixed crew. Uh, and it could be insured by somebody else, and that's what makes it a real problem, especially when we were dealing with ships that had been taken by pirates off Somalia. Who do you report to? You know, who owns, who actually owns this ship? You know, who do we negotiate with? Not, not me as a Somali pirate, but, you know. So, so why is it that we don't have... U.S. ships. You, you, it, you it said you, it was expensive. Is yeah, expensive insurance. Yeah. So, so American companies just don't want to be in the shipping industry. Well, they are in the uh, shipping industry, but they do not. They may get the profits from the ship, but they, as Claude says, they will have a foreign crew. They will have a foreign country to flag the ship. So, be flying under Panama flag, even though it's primarily doing business for the U.S. and it may be a U.S. built ship, but for economic reasons since they're using a foreign flag. But those are very rare, too. I mean, the, the top shipbuilders are now South Korea, Taiwan, 
China, yeah. maybe Japan. They're yeah. all in mm -hmm. Southeast yeah. Asia. We yeah. don't really build big freighters. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's just it's too costly for us at this point compared to other countries. The, the, that the steel, the labor, or is it a combination of everything? It's a combination of everything. Okay. But we own a lot of the ships, do we not, Claude? We, we commission have them built, and then we own them, and then we'll foreign flag and foreign crew. Some, but we but we don't have that many shipyards okay. anymore. Any commercial shipyards? They're very they're few and far between. I mean, when you look at World War II, or even in the decade after World War II, we we had a tremendous industrial capacity, and it all went away. We allowed that to happen, much like you know Spain did after the Armada or something, and we've so we've forgotten in some ways uh, what what the benefit of of building those ships yeah. is because if you can build the commercial ships you can then convert to building navy ships that is what china has been able to do and we can't so we don't have that conversion capability back in the jacksonian era and mm -hmm. i would argue probably all the way up to certainly world war ii navies were the primary projection of power correct in the world um I, I think it is less so at this point so how has and maybe bill chime in on this too how has the mission of the Navy evolved and how does it remain, um, I guess, current or, or, or relevant to geopolitical stuff? Sure. Now? And I think the best way to explain that is in terms of any town with police. You can have all the laws you want or don't want, but unless you have a police car patrolling and able to enforce and stop me as they often stop me for speeding or something, <laughs> you know, off the road. Oh, we can't go off the you record. Can't go off okay. record. Yeah, yeah, they, they never stopped me for yeah. speeding. No, uh, but without the presence of that police vehicle, you have crime that can happen wherever it wants. You'll have a, a vacuum created, and that's what happens at sea. That's why Somali piracy, I'm going back to that for a second, why it was able to uh, grow in such an ex exponential rate around 2000, especially at 08, 09, and 10, because you didn't have ships that were devoted to dealing with them. We could have, though. I mean, with the political we, will, we could have, right? And we did it, but only after the Maersk, Alabama was taken because it was one of those few U.S. ships, which I was almost on, in fact. I was, I was supposed to be on Blackwater's ship uh, in f January, February of '09, and I, I asked Maersk for a ride back because I was going to do a book on, on this whole issue. And a friend of mine who was working for Maersk at the time said, okay, we got these three ships that are beginning coming back through that area in April when you want to come back. And, you know, it was like Maersk, Arizona, Maersk something, and Maersk, Alabama. So I said, okay, I'll t once I get out there, I'll pick one of those three. So I could have actually been on the Mas Maersk, Alabama as an embedded journalist. And the funny thing was uh, my editor at uh, Washington Times, uh, who had hired me for this, said uh, the night before, I said, hey, you know, Rich, I've never done this before. What's the best case scenario? He said... He had a big cigar. He said, you know, Claude, best case scenario is uh, you get caught by Somali pirates, but they let you live so you can write about it for us. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, thanks, Rich. Yeah. So, so Maersk is an American company, is it? It is an American company, but you, yeah. And it's they, one of the biggest shipping companies in the world. It is. Uh, but they don't own all their ships? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I think they do. Okay. I don't want to misspeak here. They're, they're all they're U.S. Uh, a lot of them are U.S. flag, but I think they have to be under a specific mission and a special, specific contract for the government. So your character is Connor Stark, mm -hmm. and he runs a private navy. Mm -hmm. Talk about that a little bit. Is this something that, that we should be doing? That people should be doing? <laughs> uh, so I came I came up with this idea actually in my nonfiction world. I wrote an art, a lengthy article called "Black Waters for the Blue Waters: The Promise of Private Naval Companies" back around 2006. And in it, I argued that, you know, once Iraq and Afghanistan start coming down as, as wartime operations, chances are uh, the security companies might look for op other opportunities at sea, and that's exactly what happened. And I interviewed Eric Prince of Blackwater and other folks with the company, and then other companies started emerging to buy ships to protect and convoy ships. And the business model simply just didn't work out. There, there, wasn't, there wasn't enough business there. After a while, I mean, after several years, uh, once piracy really diminished. So, again, what I try to do is bring a little bit of reality into these novels uh, based on what I've researched and written in my nonfiction work and what I've taught in class. I taught a maritime security class, for example, and uh, this is one of the issues we looked at. And i got to say, that the, the Academy kids, if there are any listeners who have family members at the Academy, been most incredible young men and women. I mean, I've taught probably 1,300 kids 
And uh, I think all I, I've taught kids who came from East L.A. and I taught uh, some who grew up literally on Park Avenue with horses in the Hamptons. And they all are there because they want to serve something greater than themselves. Um, Although there was this one, I, I interviewed this one kid for the intelligence program. He had grown up in Russia. He came over as a 14-year-old, and I'll, I'll call him I, uh, Ivan for a second. And, I, and, and in the interview, I said, you know, Ivan, why'd you, want, why'd you want to come to the academy? He says, I always wanted to join Navy. I just did not think it would be this Navy. <laughs> <laughs> but just a great, great bunch of kids. Yeah. Claude, where would somebody find your book? Uh, Amazon.com, Sunbury Press, and they'll be out in uh, other places as well, Barnes & Noble, and so those will be out soon. And you, it's safe to say you're much more successful than John, right? Uh, do you have that rivalry <laughs> going on between the two? I'm not as dashing and good-looking as John, and I'm not as smart as him, but I try really you, hard. You were saying off, off air you stayed in the West Wing uh, of his uh, house last night? I didn't see him for days. I yeah. wandered around there. I found a couple of pieces of art from the Louvre that yeah. I didn't expect. <laughs> I always wondered where those went when I visited Paris, and uh, I was like, oh, that's nice, John. That's and nice. technically, it's the North Wing. I mean, <laughs> the North <Carolina. laughs> but it's nice when he has a team of, of carriage uh, folks to come out I to get your to vehicle, you. and uh, <laughs> the red carpet, the rose petals are coming out in the front steps. You insisted on the rose petals. <laughs> <laughs> well, Claude, I thank you for joining us.